So here is the back of my sweater, and it's still on the loom, though the back is bound off because we still need to work on the front of the sweater. Let me flip the loom up, and you will see half of my pegs are now empty because I'm finished with the back, and it's time to knit on these pegs only. And I will be knitting, as you will, back and forth, going right, left, right, left. And we will begin this just as we did the back, but we need to stop when we reach the neckline. This is the area we're going to knit first. When we reach the neckline, we'll stop knitting on these stitches and then begin knitting one side of the front at a time, gradually stopping knitting on these stitches and finishing up just knitting on shoulder stitches. Then we'll get a fresh piece of yarn and work this side as a mirror image. Doesn't really matter whether you do the right or left first. So what you need to know next is how far below the last row does the center front neckline begin. And you need to know how many stitches to stop knitting for the center front neckline. And then at what pace you gradually decrease. In my pattern, it, the decreases occur every other row, which is one of the common ways to do it, not the only way. And the center front stitch count is given to you in the pattern. And I tell you a distance here. Again, if you are using a different pattern, you need to extrapolate this distance using the information about the row gauge the pattern was designed for and the total number of rows. So just say you have 30 total rows from here to here and you're working with a gauge of 6 rows per inch and the center front begins 2 inches below the top. You would stop knitting at 30 total rows minus 12, that's 2 times 6. You'd stop knitting the center stitches after 18 rows. If you did not know what point this came at, that it was 2 inches, we could find out that it was 2 inches if you were told to stop knitting at row 18 and begin dividing the work and decreasing up one side and then up the other side of the neckline. It would be obvious that it was, in fact, 2 inches if 12 rows were knitted after the division. So you can get at the same information either way. So to start out, we're going to knot a little loop into the yarn, just like we always do to start out, because we've cut our working yarn while finishing the back. Put it on the first peg. Hang the loop on the first peg. This is just a review of the way we always start out a row. And we can begin knitting back and forth. Now because I'm knitting 15 rows in total for my front, I will be knitting back and forth for 8 rows. So I will do that. You do your rows up to the neckline and we will get back together when we've all done that. Before we actually start knitting the front, I like to orient it so I'm positive which is the right shoulder and which is the left shoulder. It only really matters in a case like this where I'm knitting a baby sweater because my right shoulder is going to be completely plain and my left shoulder is going to be finished in a different way so as to allow for the underlap. The shaping is identical, but I'm going to rib or seed stitch or something here to stop it from rolling because we'll be opening and closing it. So here's the easy way. I imagine myself in the middle of the loom. I'm the spool. 
since this is the purl side or inside of the fabric, then I must be oriented correctly. Right is truly to the right and left is truly to the left. Let's look at what I'll be doing exactly. I have 30 stitches in total on the front of this sweater. I want to end up with 8 stitches on each shoulder. I'm going to begin by holding the 8 center stitches. Holding is the word I use for the fact that the stitches are still there, but we're not knitting on them. So if you hear me do that, that's what I'm talking about. Then I'm going to knit two rows, decrease one, knit two rows, decrease one, knit two rows, decrease one, and continue knitting until my final seven rows have been knitted. So when you think about it, that's two, four, six, knit one row, and bind off on the right. And then we will do the left as a mirror image. So let's get started. On my setup, I have now marked and tied this magenta yarn around the center eight stitches. If you counted this side and this side, you would discover that you have 11 on each side. But at the corner, you have three on one side and five on the other. That's because one of the runs is 16 stitches and one is 14. Depending on your particular setup, you must position your center stitches based on the reality of the number of stitches, not based on loom position. So here we are. Working yarn is at the right now. And I'm going to turn the work so that I can actually get to it. I had it oriented the way we were looking at to make sure that I positioned things correctly. So we'll knit the two rows. There's one of them. I'll knit it over. And now let's knit back the other way. This is row two. And I'll knit that over. Now it's time to decrease one at the neck edge. And I have some choices. I could just do this. And the next two rows I would knit on these pegs only. Or, that's a simple decrease, I could do a full fashion decrease, moving two stitches over, which makes it easier to seam because we have a continuous column of stitches here. Here's my third choice, and today I'm going to take the third choice. Just put this stitch into hold. In other words, stop knitting it. And that will give me a smooth bind off around the neck shaping. So here's the only hard part of this process. It's not really hard at all. You just have to keep your wits about you. And that's remembering that this is my last stitch. I must not knit that one this row. Otherwise I wouldn't get any further neck shaping. So this is row three out of seven. Then we'll knit back row four out of seven and do another decrease. In my case, simply place an additional stitch in the hold. So here I am, knitting row four. Now, whichever method of decreasing you selected, keep it consistent throughout this project. Use a different project to try a different method. If you're afraid that you'll forget to leave these out of work, you can always hang some sort of a stitch marker. There we go. That reminds me, don't knit either this one or this one next row. Wrapping row number five. And I'll knit that over. 
Time to wrap row number six. And I will come and knit that over off camera. Following row six comes my final decrease. So if I want to remind myself, I can wrap my yarn around there. Now I only have one more row to knit. This is row seven. And if I did everything right, it should be on eight stitches. And I'm counting as I go. And it is eight. So we'll knit it over together. And now it's time to bind off this shoulder. As soon as I've knitted it over, of course. Since my working yarn is on my right hand side and it really doesn't matter whether we bind off right to left or left to right, I'll just bind off using the transfer bind off that I showed you before, wrapping around the pins as before to make sure of spacing. All right, time to trim my yarn. Notice these shoulder stitches, that they don't cover much width. So it can be helpful to leave between 12 and 20 inches of yarn, depending on the size, because we could leave this attached after pulling it through so as to use it to show, sew the shoulder seam, making one less stray piece of yarn an attachment. And there is my shoulder. Now we're going to repeat the same thing on the other side. If this happens to you, what just happened to me, do not panic. I accidentally was a little rough with it and I lifted a held stitch off a peg. Back it goes, no disaster. Now let me position my holding yarn so that you can see what's going on and I'll do this other side. In all honesty, I don't normally mark it, I just count as I go which is easy enough to do if nobody is distracting you. If there are things going on, probably you do want a marker. All right, all set up to do my left shoulder. And the, these are my held stitches that I'm starting out with. These are the 11 that I will begin with. It doesn't matter greatly whether I start on the right or the left. It will affect where my yarn tails are to weave in and where I end up when I really need to bind off. So having thought about all that and knowing I'm knitting an odd number of rows, I decided to go on the armhole side, but it's not a big deal. Now my first two rows, I'm gonna do exactly like the first two on the other side. Knit to here, knit over, knit back, knit over, and do a decrease. So I'll see you when I'm done. All right, I've completed my first two rows of seven. My yarn tail, the working yarn, is over here now. Time to put another stitch into hold, which just means don't work it, but I'm going to mark it like that. Now, at this point, something changes. I'm going to knit, every time I get to either edge, I'm going to knit a knit stitch. And then, in between, I'm going to knit and purl, and make seed stitch. So the stitches that are knitted this row will be purled next row. Here's why I'm choosing seed stitch. Partly as a design feature and partly because it does not pull in and will not distort the shoulder. I did do on the underlapping tab ribbing, which will pull in a little bit. However, it's on the underside, so the fact that it's pulling in will actually assist me in keeping it discreet and out of sight. Last stitch, knit stitch every row. And so the first stitch is also a knit stitch every row. There we go. It didn't want to wrap for me. Now this stitch was a purl stitch last row. So this time it will be a knit stitch. Now I really don't have to look anymore and see what's what because I know it's alternating across. So I know what's what. 
I'm going to keep on doing this at the same time as decreasing. So I'm working now on row number four of my seven rows. Here's how I decided to do seed stitch for five rows of my seven. I'm getting five rows per inch. I want about an inch of seed stitch. Simple. It would not ruin matters at all to have decided to do six rows. So if you, and I've got seven rows of neckline shaping, and even that wouldn't have been ruinous, but I think it would be a little disproportionate and unnecessary. You can see my seed stitch beginning to form. Time to decrease again. I won't knit on that. I will knit on this. And I've checked that was a purl last row, so I know to start with a knit. Purl. Knit. Purl. Knit. Purl. The next one's a knit, and I want my edge stitch to be a knit. So there we go. I'm going to work back across now, and then it'll be time for the final decrease. This should be a purl because it was a knit last row. I'm going to finish this row off camera to give my neck a rest. Time to decrease one more time. So I'll just expand that and double check that I have eight. Yes, one more row to knit on these eight with a knit stitch. And that was a purl last row. You can't see it in the camera, but I can see it from where I am. Knit. So we should get a nice little tab that doesn't roll. One more thing I should have told you, but I can still tell you. I'm going to close this with big snaps, probably, because I have some handy and they do a good job, and I favor them over Velcro and buttons. Buttons are cute, but babies can worry them off. However, if I had decided on a buttonhole, I would have gone on the fourth or fifth of these pegs, since I only have eight stitches. With more stitches, I would make more buttons. And I would have made a buttonhole like this. Then the next row... If we wrap it and knit it, it will form an eyelet that you can get a good sized button into to close that shoulder. While I finish this and start binding off the shoulder, I will tell you what the three options are and why I favor um, snaps. Velcro is very good and you sew it on by hand or the sewing machine but with many, many stitches so it's very secure, which is safe. Choking hazard and buttons and babies, you know the whole story. And I really prefer to be careful. However, Velcro also catches on the part of the knit that you don't want it to catch on unless you're super careful with handling everything. I, I mean, not just when knitting, when washing, when dressing the kid, whatever. Buttons are cute, but I do think they may be a little more uncomfortable for the child making a stiff bump where there's not much room on a baby's neck and head. And there is the matter that they are incredibly good at worrying off those buttons, and then we have reason to worry. Snaps are also sewn on in many places, just like Velcro, so they're harder to worry off, and they do not stand up like buttons do, so you, the child can't get fingers underneath them. So they can do a nice job of closure with a minimum of danger. And that's why I select them. 
I'm going to be using metal snaps, I think, because I have them and because you can see them better on the film. But in fact, there exist large nylon snaps, which are really ideal. Okay, last stitch of the bind off. I'm gonna snip, leaving a good tail just in case I can give a reason to use it. Pull through and lift off. So here are all my neckline stitches. I don't have any working yarn close to what I'm doing, so I need to hang on a new piece. And now I will just bind off using the same method that we have been. Then I will pop this off and we'll have a look at my sweater. Here's my ribbing. Here's the cast on edge. And you can see that even though I did not reduce the stitch size, the ribbing does pull in some. Moving up the sweater. Here's the right shoulder and armhole. The safety pin is holding the seam where I will make it. Not, it's not seamed yet. And that will be our next step. The neckline is unappealing and still rolling and looks rather large. That is because we haven't yet made our neckband. And after the shoulder seam, that's the next thing we'll do there. Here is the left armhole. The seed stitch overlapping the ribbed area. And although the whole thing's a mess right now, you can begin to imagine how it may work. My snap will be here and here. So, next video, and we will get on with working the neckband.